it seems to me that complementarianism, egalitarianism still around, both of them, <laughs> but that that debate has changed somewhat over the last uh, few years. Do you think that's the case? And if, if so, where do you think that this discussion about what should be the differences, if any, between gifting and calling with men and women, where do you think that's what do you think that's going to look like in the future? And I guess one of one piece of that that I'm really interested in is to say, how much can we get along and work together in a common mission, even when we disagree on some of these things, the way that we do, say, with really major emphases in the Bible, such as baptism and, and Lord's Supper, we're able to figure out how to cooperate without being in agreement on all of those. Is that possible with this debate? Or Thank you not? for asking me such a small and simple question, uh, Dr. <laughs> <Sorry>. Moore. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so I think that we live in fractious times. And so I, it's difficult to say that any conversation and in which people differ is going to come to a place of parity anytime in the near future, but we will certainly all pray that direction. I do think that in the complementarian circle the issue of preaching has just reached a fever pitch and who can do it and and what is it? And I do think that complementarians can do each other a favor by clarifying terms as much as possible. In other words, what is preaching? What is it not? If it's tone of voice, if it's content, then uh, lots of people are preaching. If it has to do with a particular person in a particular setting, then we've, we've clarified things a great deal. My own church did a lot of work around this, which meant that in a complementarian setting, I've been able to have a lot of clarity about where the lines are. Clarity is kindness. And so it, this is the work of every local church. You, you need to land somewhere. And then you need to operate out of that perspective. And I, I think if we spent less time worrying about what the church next door is doing and more time making sure that our own local church is functioning in a healthy way, then the conversation might simmer down a little. And I also do believe firmly that this issue of the family of God as the paradigm for determining whether a church has a healthy practice of male-female roles should be examined. So if you can quote your theological statement to me all day long and you can show me all of your, and I believe me, I know which passages you're going to quote, uh, and you're going to tell me how you got there. But when I come and visit your church, I see a, a, a family that is functionally an authoritarian father and children and an absentee mother. Then I've got questions about how your practice has translated from your theology into a healthy family. That being said, I think that is exactly right. And, and that's, that's, I think, one of the things that if we actually see that biblical pattern of household of God, that we realize there are there are some things that are different about Absolutely. mothers and fathers, but usually those things are not trackable on a chart. <laughs> they're 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 more in terms of vibe, and so you just can't say, well, the mother's the nurturer and the father's authoritative, because any father that's only authoritative and not nurturing is a an awful human being. And any mother that's nurturing and not authoritative is not going to be a mother for long. So you, you, you do have, you do have most of what we're doing is yeah. in sync with yeah. some differences. And I think too, that an important point to note in the discussion of the family of God is that when we have an absentee mother situation in the local church, the women of our churches don't stop looking for a mother. They go outside of the church to find that mother. And one of the things that I find in, in conversations with pastors through the years is if I were to mention the names of the most influential big C church or, or parachurch women, they either would know the name but nothing about the woman or they would not even have heard the name before. And yet these women are functional church mothers for over half of their congregation. And so when we leave the work of ministry 
undone in the local church. Women don't stop looking for women's ministry. They go elsewhere to find it. So you've essentially, by by the sin of omission, outsourced spiritual formation of your women to you don't actually know who. It might be the church down the road, or it might be an internet presence. And so that's another reason that having a creative imagination around identifying and developing the gifts of female leaders in your church is significant. Because if you believe that your theology is distinctive in the first place, then don't entrust the formation of half of your congregation to to people whose names you barely know and whose theological positions you may have no knowledge of at all.